so let me start introducing our next speaker our next speaker is amit sharma uh, he works at microsoft research india and he's going to talk about very important and interesting topic today called moments of change technology for supporting our mental health so it's a combination of computer science um, and uh, health so and how uh, what do you call it? machine learning and big data comes into this uh, this area of work and how naturally these things are so you will get a first hand opportunity to hear and listen to one of the practitioners of the field so with this i would request amit to start his lecture or talk for all of you amit over to you thank you saket yeah it's my pleasure to uh, talk at this uh, winter school uh, as saket said i work at microsoft research uh, we are a lab in bangalore and our lab looks at different ways uh, and research questions of computer science but one particularly uh, that's of importance is the question of how technology can be useful for the unique challenges that india faces today uh, and i'll talk about one such challenge that i work on uh, this is mental health and one of the things that i should say at the beginning is that uh, my training is in computer science i think like many of you uh, so i don't think that i am an expert when i talk about mental health uh, but what i'll try to give you a flavor of is how by communicating and talking to domain experts from other fields in this case uh, i work with clinical psychologists and uh, mental health professionals uh, you can learn from them to abstract out what may be the computer science problems uh, and then make your contributions uh, accordingly at any point of time if uh, you have questions uh, i don't know how to do that saket can people just speak up uh, they they just they can just unmute uh, uh, and they can speak up or they can ask a question in the chat so i will moderate it if there is something asked in chat but i would just say that they should just unmute yourself then and ask question because that is the format we have followed because at the end of the day it's a school yeah yeah i think that's best because that way it's interactive Yes. Uh, so yeah, right. everyone just feel free to speak up, uh, I'm, and I can answer questions during the talk. All right. So, with that introduction, uh, I'll talk about first uh, just a broad introduction to mental health. Uh, what kinds of challenges are unique to India, and then how technology can help in this very complex uh, issue. so as the world health organization describes mental health as a state of well being in which every individual realizes his or her potential and as you can see this definition is very broad right so it's not about a specific kind of condition or ailment uh mental health really is unique among different types of or different sort of classifications of health in that it covers not just a particular biological condition but the whole capability of a person to realize their potential so this would mean if you're a student like how are you functioning as a student and are your environment and your sort of feelings and emotions uh, consistent with what sort of would make you a productive uh, person in that field and mental illness then is the other side so mental health you can think of it more as wellness that allows you to reach your potential ah, okay. yeah and mental illness is on the other side where people uh develop conditions where uh they are unable to realize uh whatever sort of tasks or potential uh they might have uh so for example uh, depression and anxiety are one of the two most common uh ailments in the world in the us for example depression affects more than 13% uh more than 20% in the us and more than 13% of the indian adult population uh claim and are self reported to have uh depression uh and worldwide there are over 30, 350 million people who may be suffering from depression uh one of the alarming statistics that also comes from who is that by 2030 it may be the number one cause of disease burden worldwide which which means that it will surpass heart disease today uh, which is the number one now with that grim background uh, the other thing that's 
very alarming about mental health is that it's not that some countries have figured it out. Uh, so there are studies that show that even in uh, rich countries like US, Europe, only 20% of adults actually receive some kind of treatment. Uh, and similarly, in the global south, which are more low and middle income countries like India, I guess many of you may be already aware from your experience that it's really bad, right? So first of all, there's stigma. So people don't actually speak up uh, even when they're suffering. And second, that about treatment facilities are, are really bad, right? Uh, and so the conclusion of all this is that if, if you have uh, certain mental health conditions and if you're living in India, your, your chances of getting treatment are very dire. Uh, and our president once uh, said that India is facing a possible mental health epidemic. So in that background, there are two ways to look at it. So one is that it is true that this is a dire situation. Uh, and it's also more worrying that it's not talked about as much as it should be given the scale of the problem. Uh, but at the other hand, it's also an opportunity to reimagine the mental health care ecosystem in, in the sense that since in many cities outside the top cities in India, almost nothing exists in terms of mental health care infrastructure. Uh, how do we redesign that today, given the technology and the know-how uh, that we have from a technological point of view? Uh, one thing we have to be careful with, of course, is that it's a very complex problem. Uh, so we have to be so socially aware. We also have to be culturally aware and probably also community driven in how we uh, address this problem. Uh, so it's not just about sort of, hey, I have some great technology, let's see how it can be applied. Uh, in fields like these, I think you have to be a computer scientist, but then you also have to have knowledge about the cultural norms and also how community functions uh, to make some something work. So here's a quick primer uh, to the different mental health uh, conditions that are typically uh, diagnosed and that are also quite common uh, in today's world. So at the top, you can see a well-functioning individual. Almost all of us have worries, lack of energy, fatigue on days, on some days, and then other days uh, they go away. And so if you look at the top, this is the set of people this is basically everyone, right? So the people are going through these different kinds of emotions uh, off and on. But as you go down, what starts happening is that uh, these kinds of distress emotions uh, start taking more, taking up more and more of your, of your time and your experience. And that's when uh, people say that early treatment is useful. Uh, so at the top, you have mental well-being. There's no distress. Uh, when when sort of these things are getting more attenuated, uh, then you would want to start thinking of treatment or some kind of therapy that can be useful. And as you can see, as the person goes uh, more towards the bottom of this figure, uh, these are sort of specific mental health syndromes that can be diagnosed by a clinical psychologist or a psychiatrist. Uh, so you may have sort of the first bucket, which is anxiety, which is more connected to panic and avoidance. You may have mood syndromes, depression, and in severe cases, also psychosis. So with that introduction, uh, you can start thinking that, first of all, it's not something that you can imagine can be solved by one machine learning algorithm or one sort of technology that you can deploy in a hospital, right? If you, if you just look at it, I think you'll realize uh, that it's much more multi-pronged than that. And one of the things that has happened is that in different stages, uh, different kinds of interventions have been shown to work. So at the top, peer support uh, tends to be one of the best uh, ways to uh, address people's distress. Uh, so this could be as simple as talking to a friend, uh, or it could be sort of a more institutionalized way of connecting you to anonymous peers and, and sort of sharing what you're going through. And the second step, we have semi-trained counselors or phone helplines. Uh, so ideally, peer counselors can sort of only help so much. But then uh, one of the best innovations that has come up in the world in mental health is that you don't always need a doctor or you don't always need someone who's a clinical psychiatrist uh, 
to to converse with a person and sort of help them in early stages i think even with basic training semi trained counselors and phone helplines can help so you can think of them in the health world if you if you are aware of community health workers like asha workers in india this is the alternate of that in mental health and then finally of course we have clinical psychologists or psychiatrists uh these are needed and i think these are the sort of main experts here uh but what india has evolved and i think of many countries have evolved is a system that sort of has all three uh working and this is what i'm showing you as examples here so peer support today is uh with friends but also online so just like facebook there are communities stock life and seven cups of life seven cups of tea uh that provide peer support uh to anyone so you can be a user who joins anonymously you share what you're going through and other people come and support you uh similarly there are phone helplines in india uh we maintain a repository of all phone helplines on this website that you can see i need help now dot in and these helplines help people in times of crisis or or sometimes in in lieu of therapy so, so if you're in a small town and you uh have no access to therapy uh, often people call these helplines which are available and then finally this is more relevant to a technical audience is that there are now apps coming up uh, so i've just mentioned two that are built out of india in arava and waisa and these apps are trying to simulate what sort of happens in therapy uh with some simple self help techniques that people can use in this talk uh i'll try to give you a flavor of how technology can amplify these support systems uh so in part 1 we'll talk about peer support and if there are people already going online and talking about their feelings uh being vulnerable there uh how can machine learning augment their experience so that they get better help online in the second part i'll talk about the the sort of hard problem of stigma because we have to remember that there are some people going online but for everyone who everyone for every one person who goes online self expresses themselves knows about things like depression there are many others uh, who uh, don't even probably know what they're going through or they don't feel that what they're going through is is sort of something that is common and something that can be taken help for and then so second part we'll talk about this kind of catch 22 situation that if someone is struggling but they don't know the right resources or they don't even know the right process thought process to sort of find help then can we actually reach them and and help and then finally if time permits we'll talk a little bit about india's phone helpline systems uh this is also a project that we are working on uh and just seeing how the current helplines can become uh more technology gil savvy uh and and sort of help uh more people with the same helplines with that background uh, are there any questions at this point okay so i'll go to the next part where we'll talk about these projects uh and one thing uh i think the main point of the stock is that here we'll try to amplify the existing support systems our our goal is not to build a new ai bot uh that can probably talk to people and kind of solve mental health right uh so so i think that's maybe my number one message is that in when you're working in fields uh outside of computer science you have to be humble and sort of understand what are the present solutions and then if they are good then how do we try to amplify them if they are not good how do we try to sort of reduce uh the the damage that they are doing and try to build uh it's very rarely the case that that you can just come up with something on your own and have it work in in the sort of complex socio technical systems that we build and that's the summary expressed here as well technology is best when it's connecting people to existing resources so we'll look at how technology can be used to connect people to mental health resources as well as mental health experts and as a computer scientist i think of my role as empowering the mental health organizations that are already doing good work all right uh so the first part we'll look at uh how data and machine learning can help uh in this ecosystem if you're not familiar uh 
I'm just giving examples of two websites, but this is now a very popular phenomenon where people go online anonymously often and and share some of their most uh, private and vulnerable so feelings, what they're experiencing, going through. Uh, and then magically, other people on the internet who may not know this person actually come and respond. So this whole idea is bound by the strong sense of community where a lot of young people are helping each other. And in some way, it's, it's, it's good because only sort of in some sense, many topics can only be answered by your peers uh, of a similar age group, of a similar uh, background, and so on. And so this is really good, uh, but it's all not that golden. So let me give you some examples of typical interactions that happen on these kinds of websites. Uh, so the first person, let's call them a seeker. Uh, they say that they're being overwhelmed. Uh, there's a responder who comes and, and sort of tries to give them some simple uh, reflection techniques, and then they also give them some suggestions. And so this person says that this is great. I hadn't thought of it, and this helped them. Right? So this is the kind of ideal interaction that you would want. But at the same time, this is an online social network, right? So what do you expect? So other times when, in this case, a person is talking about uh, suicide and the response that comes is actually a bad joke on, on that. And so what we really want on these systems is that the first kind of conversations should prevail and somehow there should be less of the second kind of conversation. And there are more sort of sad cases on the on these kinds of websites uh, where someone expresses themselves, says what they're going through, but then nobody responds. So it's just completely blank, uh, and perhaps it sort of reinforces the 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 sort of bad feelings that a person might be having about being alone and and so on, right? Uh, so we don't want the things on the right, and what do we do about that? So we worked with this uh, organization called TalkLife. Uh, this is a company that runs uh, one of these online social networks. And our goal with them was to first see if we can use data to identify the problematic conversations. And second, if we can use uh, the user level data to see what responses can be effective. Uh, so we took data from these websites uh, and we had data from about 3.2 million posts and 25 million responses. And this was data for everyone who joined after 2016. Uh, just a second, I'll be moving. And in this work, we were looking at what kinds of conversations and users, as I said, are more connected uh, to good responses. So the hard question in here is how do you define what's an effective conversation? Uh, one thing could be that you say it's positive and you can say that the change that happens in a particular user's response is a positive cognitive change. So for example, you may have variance nuance definitions in clinical psychology. Uh, they are often measured using a qualitative scale and it's hard to capture from text data. And when we came in, we saw that if we rely on the really uh, true definition, it may be very difficult. And therefore a better way of doing this would be to rely on uh, something simple that we can develop uh, but then what we do is that we try to see how much does this simple metric that we have correspond to uh, the real uh, value that we want to establish. So that's what we did here. Uh, while we do realize that characterizing what may be useful to a person is, is really hard, uh, we said that let's start with something simple. So let's say that if you observe a change in sentiment for a seeker on a topic that they initially talked about, that's a moment of positive change. Right? So we, in some sense, we have abstracted out this problem from a psychological concept to now a change in sentiment. Uh, and today, natural language processing is good enough that you can actually detect change in sentiment uh, using text. 
And the way we tried to detect whether this was working or not was that we also collected data from anonymous crowdsource workers on whether when we detected that there was a moment of change, whether people also thought the sentiment increased. So here, for example, you can see that uh, this is one of the texts that we showed to anonymous annotators. And they their task was to label the sentiment, whether it has an increase or not. And what we found was that about 80% of the conversations uh, can be identified by something simple, like not even natural language processing, but sort of just labeling the conversations if they had some explicit expressions. I'm giving some examples here. Uh, so someone might say, thanks, I feel better now. Or they might say things like, hey, you have a point. So this is useful. So one thing to note here is that uh, these expressions would be high precision. Right? Because if someone says that, more often than not, they did feel better, uh, but they won't be high recall. So that's something to keep in mind. So in some sense, we'll get a lot of conversations uh, where people felt better, uh, but that may not mean that we are getting all kinds of good conversations. Once that was done, uh, we could imagine building a machine learning model where we have these labels of two types. Right, One type is where people actually self reported that they felt well, and the other was these label data. And then we did a 50-50 split between moments of change and non-moments of change threads. Uh, so this is standard machine learning. If you uh, already had lectures about uh, building predictive models, that's what we are doing here. We have labels now based on the uh, text that I just showed you. Uh, and then now we want to find out the features that lead to positive conversations. Uh, the specific features we used uh, are from both the psychology literature as well as NLP. So from the psychological literature, we took linguistic inquiry and word count based features. And for the others, we used mental health uh, based features, which were used in NLP before. So think of them like n-grams for specific words like anxiety, depression, suicide, and other concepts. And the model that we used, we tried a bunch, but I think I'll just describe gradient boosted trees. Uh, so the model here uh, was pretty standard. We found some impressive results. Uh, so you can detect conversations with moments of change with high accuracy. So for example, the language used by responders is most predictive of a moment of change. Uh, this was slightly counterintuitive, right? So if you think about detecting a positive change in a seeker's sentiment, it turns out that it's not important to look at what the seeker is saying, but it's important to look at what the responder is saying. Uh, and post hoc, that kind of made sense, right? Because you, the the change has to be brought about only by what the responder can say. And so what that's what we find in our machine learning model as well. And then words related to sentiment, affect, intimacy, and mental health language were important. But the important thing is there is here that we were able to detect with 88% accuracy on whether a particular conversation will be useful or not. And one way you can imagine this is great is because now Talk Life can predict in advance on which conversations would be beneficial, or at least after a conversation has happened, maybe every day, they can look at the current conversations and say which ones have been good, which automatically means they have now data upon which conversations are not going well. And maybe that's where they can send their most experienced responders. But hang on a minute. Uh, we are getting ahead of ourselves because it's not clear that we have kind of solved this problem, right? So one thing that we tried to do was some kind of basic sanity checks on, on our model. So one, one Im immediate thing you can imagine is that there are multiple users from different countries. What if we train our model on data from India and test our model on data from non-Indian conversations. Uh, similarly, you can imagine the reverse where you can train on everyone from outside India and then test on Indians. So here's what we find. If you're training and testing on the same population, we get similar high accuracies. But as soon as you generalize your model to a different country, uh, our accuracy decreases. And in one case, it's about 0.68, uh, which is really low uh, compared to 88 earlier. And so this tells us two things. One is that context matters. Uh, it means that people in India may be expressing their feelings differently, and people outside may be expressing differently. 
And it's probably not going to be the case that the same model is going to work uh, for everyone. The second thing which is more worrying is that it also is showing that our model is only capturing the surface level features, right? So in a sense, it's just sort of capturing some kinds of words or some kinds of features that are connected to emotions, but they're not really capturing the real uh, change in emotion itself, right? Because if it, they were, then they should have generalized mu much better than what we see. And if you want to think more deeply about this, uh, you can also think of in terms of causal inference. Uh, so it's usually tricky to differentiate causes between positive cognitive change versus just correlated features. So here's an example that I'm showing you. Uh, imagine that you had two people and you got some responses. And in one case, the cognitive change was negative. In one case, it was positive, right? What may be happening is that the responses are causing the cognitive change, and that would be the world one. But it's also likely that there is just some baseline confounders or baseline prior knowledge about the seeker that is also leading to cognitive change, right? Uh, so maybe what's happening is something people when post when people do a post about let's say academics, there's a higher chance that they'll have a positive cognitive change, perhaps because their exam gets over or, or some other thing happens. But maybe when people talk about relationships or when they talk about some other topics, it's very hard to get a cognitive change. And so this is something that I want you to keep in mind is that even though we are using machine learning models to predict, uh, we have to be careful to check whether they're actually, their features are what we think uh, should be, right? So we have to be careful to check whether the features they are capturing also capture the processes by which cognitive change happens. So we've done other work, uh, which I'll not talk about in detail, uh, but just give you a flavor of what do you do when you think that there is a machine learning model that works, but maybe it's not capturing the causal features. Maybe it's just capturing some correlations. So what you can do is you can use methods from, again, borrowed from uh, medicine and epidemiology, where you're trying to find same features again, but now you do a much better controlling. So earlier we were just looking at, hey, here's some people who had a positive change. Here's some people who did not have a positive change. Let's just try to find which features are different between them. You can just do the same analysis in a more careful way, where now we'll still have people who had positive change and people who did not have positive change, but we'll try to only match those people who had similar backgrounds and who were talking about similar topics. That's the basic idea. Uh, you can do it on much broader and much sort of specific variables as well. But for the purpose of understanding, just think of it in a way that we are just controlling people and matching people with similar topics and similar backgrounds. And so therefore, now if you change, see a change in feature between someone who got a positive change and not, then you can say, okay, that has to be because of the response or that has to be because of the activity that we are seeing. And when you do that, you find that it becomes much more interesting. Uh, so first of all, obvious things like immediacy of response or the emotions that are used by the responder actually don't have that much of an effect. So if you look on the left, I'm showing you a plot where there's a treatment difference between case and control, which means how much was this feature useful for improving a person's mental health. Uh, and on the x-axis, I'm showing the different features. And here you see that the most important features actually turn out to be complex linguistic features. Uh, so topical congruence means whether the response was on topic or not. Linguistic accommodation means that whether the style of English used by the responder was matching to what the original seeker had said. And this perhaps again, you can think of is, is pointing to something more deeper, which was perhaps whether the person was empathizing with the seeker's response. And so with these, we had a much better idea of what was really helping. So it was not just a matter of responding quickly or a matter of just having some positive looking information. It was more a matter of adapting and being on topic to what the person was worried about. And here, I think one thing you can imagine is that 
this is wonderful. And we probably should now think about how you can implement this on a website like Talk Life. Uh, here, we are still working with, with them. But I think one of the challenges we are facing is that uh, Talk Life asks questions like, how good is this model on different kinds of data? So I just give you a simple example about India and rest of India. Uh, you can also imagine many different ways of comparing people and whether the model is good for older people versus younger people, whether the model is good for Europe versus India. And so there are lots of questions that we still have to work on before this could be something that we would be comfortable deploying at a large scale. Uh, because I think the second thing that we have to think about, like one, this is very exciting and we have used machine learning uh, to understand mental health better. But on the other hand, once the model is deployed, it's going to affect people's interactions on that platform. So we have to get much better data on how it's going to be impacting that. So that's the first part of the talk. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, I'd welcome them at this point. Oh, I have a question. Sure. Yeah, so uh, the data set that we are talking about over here is the data set from Talk Life, right? The uh, yes. So, so every con, so all the every da every data point in this data set is basically someone talking to a counselor, and that counselor replying, or someone on the website having a conversation, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I mean, don't you think that by uh, by virtue of going to such a website, the conversation is colored? For example, if I'm talking to you as a friend, uh, Amit, who is my friend, uh, maybe, maybe I'll be, uh, uh, you know, say, I mean, maybe by going to a website like this, you want to talk like this, or you, you know, maybe you are forced to talk in a yeah. way so yeah. that you gain attention or you gain empathy or you want mm. to, you want someone to notice you. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, don't you see, don't you think that the data set in itself is colored. I mean, yeah, I think it's probably likely. And it's not just about uh, that people may express them in a different way. It's yeah. also that the kind of people who know about this website and are going there already yeah. colors the data, right? Because the specific yeah. demographic, I can almost think like people who have good access to internet, good fluency in English and, and so on, right? So especially in an Indian context. Uh, yeah. I agree. Yeah, I think this this is certainly a biased sample. Uh, but what I was talking about was even within this biased sample, can we find patterns that generalize to only yeah. the users of this platform? Even that is hard. That's what I was trying to say. So yeah. even if you look for only the people who are using only this platform, uh, yeah. even then we found sort of very, very, very degrees of how people express themselves. So because uh, I was your point, some... Yeah. Uh, I'm ahead. sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, please go, go ahead, on. Yeah. Oh no, my, my question was, uh, uh, so, I mean, two months ago, I was talking to a sad friend. So, I mean, he was sad because something was happening in his life. Right. And I remember myself writing something on WhatsApp, uh, deleting it, writing again, deleting it, because I thought that maybe I should talk in a this way. Then I right. wrote the sentence, yeah. I deleted that. Then I wrote something. And then when I was sure that I should send this message, I sent it. Right. And you know, there are so many nuances to writing and conversing with people that the final sentence a final conversation might not catch. So, I mean, we have made so many That's edits true. in that sentence that, you know, yeah. maybe we have not uh, express ourselves honestly, as honestly as we should have in the first attempt. Yes. That so, is true. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe this data set can be augmented to, you know, so basically we augment this data set with artificial insertions that this is what the data set should have looked like but this person has not mentioned it. This person has mm -hmm. just deleted it or does not want to talk about it. I mean, just an yeah. idea. Yeah. And I think uh, it may be also possible. I, I think if, if you have a smaller set of people that we may have access to, let's say general social media and then this platform, right. For the same person. So exactly. that, that can also give us an idea of how much language changes. Uh, exactly. In, exactly. In, in yeah. This. That's true. Yeah. That, that's yeah. some. The, actually, so there have been some studies uh, that people have done on Reddit and Twitter, uh, but I think even they suffered from the same issue that they're only looking at Reddit 
users activity in a particular mental health forum but i think we yeah, are comparing them would be interesting as as you said yeah uh, there's yeah. actually a second application i won't get time today but i just want to mention that writing suggestions is itself a big application uh where i believe nlp can help uh, but i think we don't have good answers yet so what i mean by yeah. that is suppose you are a supporter on this platform right and someone posts a message you have very good intentions to help them right but and you would write something that you believe will help this person but does it really help them right and yeah. that is complex it's very hard to predict of course but it also depends on where that person the seeker is coming from what have they actually yeah. asked are they are looking for resources are they looking for emotional help right and so we have tried to do this a little bit with with what i described in the sense of can you predict what kinds of features in a response help yeah and if we can get to a stage where we are confident then you can imagine writing suggestions so imagine that someone writes a response and there might be a tool that says hey this response seems too rude perhaps you yeah. want, you want to make it more polite to this user or hey this yes, response yes, yes. seems to be too much on the informational side and this person is looking for emotional support not not informational yeah. support um, yeah. so we are not there yet but but i think what you said made me think about this application which could be really uh, useful for people yes sir any other questions so what was the human annotation scale which you mentioned on the previous slide oh okay let me go back to that yeah the scheme here was yeah yeah this one yeah so the scheme here was very simple uh, people would be shown these posts and what they have to do is just rate the sentiment of the particular post and behind the scenes what we were doing was that we would take a thread of these posts let's say a seeker then responder and then seeker again and then look at the sentiment rated by people for each of these posts and check whether the sentiment changed or not so we we did this consciously we didn't want the you the raters to have a much complicated task so rather than asking the raters hey whether this was a positive conversation we just asked the raters to rate the sentiment of a single individual posts and then we post process it to find out which which threads had a positive change okay so uh, can we model this into a reinforcement learning model like the uh, like in whether the goal has been reached or not like the positive rating mm. has achieved or not can we do something like this yes like yeah so if you do it in real time yes yeah so this study that that i'm describing to you we had a data set and we were kind of doing it after the fact and trying to predict uh but you're right i think if you're doing it in real time you can imagine a system which is learning from uh the different responses that people are giving and especially in the writing suggestions one this can be very fruitful so if, like imagine a seeker posts a response one Sorry. responder posts something and we just realized that, that did not help right uh, so now how should the th- second responder respond and that i think you can you can use uh policies to yes, optimize that or even though we can use reinforcement learning just to track where is the conversation going on like if the rating yeah. is decreasing if the com- conversation is not going the right way or if it's increasing uh, how it is increasing so that can be modeled i guess to improve the system maybe yes yeah i think the only thing i'll caution against is that uh we still don't know enough about this environment to talk in reinforcement learning language right so reinforcement learning typically works well where you can define sort of the rewards and and these sort of features in a much more principled way uh here i would say we are still in the infancies of making those reward functions correct and also understanding like what what are good outcomes uh so for example here i use this very crude measure of change in sentiment but as i said it doesn't capture all of the good responses it doesn't capture all of the good interactions so we just have to be careful i think rl can be applied but you have to be careful that just optimizing in a, a metric like this may not be enough i think we have to do sort of innovate on both parts like innovating on the measurement which is the reward function as well as the policy okay 
थैंक यू सर ग्रेट आई मूव ऑन टू द सेकंड पार्ट uh so this part think of it as more operational uh one part that we can help with is data science but then there's also a bigger chunk of people who are not even aware of these apps and probably don't have access to it because these apps are all english and on the internet so i've been talking to and working with uh, nimhans which is a mental health institution in bangalore and one of my collaborators dr simon herotra says that people often take a long circuitous route to ultimately reach us and seek counseling and perhaps this is because there's fear and stigma uh, even about admitting uh, that you may have uh, a mental health condition or an issue and you may want to go to a counselor right or a therapist so we thought about how to increase awareness about mental health at the same time not mentioning mental health now you now you understand the catch when it do right uh, even though there are very few psychologists in india i think that's also true but what we are hearing from the psychologists is that even they can handle more people and they can they would want more people to come to them early but what happens is that even the people who are coming to them are saying things like oh i took one year or i took one to two years to try everything else before before i actually thought of coming to you So the question here is how to encourage people to speak out and seek help uh, but at the same time be mindful that there is a stigma in our society So uh, Dr Seema actually did a study first on trying to understand what are people's barriers to seeking help uh, and when you read through this list uh, some of them would immediately probably resonate uh, with you uh, people may think that counseling will make them weak or make them considered weak by others uh they may affect retribution from job from their family uh they may think that it's not a problem like it's just something that may go away uh and sometimes they just think they just don't believe that it can be like help by therapy one common misconception often is that therapy is just like talking i can just talk for free with anyone so perhaps why would i need something uh, to pay for or for being a professional help anyways so i just wanted to mention all these uh, because uh, many of these actually are impeding people from reaching out which means that as simple as even if there's an app available right let's say there's an app available for mental health and let's say that it's magical like it will just solve there's nothing like this exists but i'm just saying it as a thought experiment suppose there's a magical app that exists even then people may not use that app because they might think of many of these things that i just mentioned so we thought about uh what can we create uh that helps people actually cross these barriers and encourage them to talk to a real person so in our case it's a therapist but you can also imagine peer support acting in a similar way that you want more people to come to talk life uh but how do you increase awareness about talk life in a way that people are willing to use it so we came up with this basically like two step architecture the first is that we have to focus on breaking these barriers so we have to focus on how we can help people sort of just reframe whatever concerns they have uh and present them alternative information and the second was self discovery we also want to enable people to learn about themselves as well because you might be feeling low sad anxious but you may not be understanding exactly what is going on so with that we thought that let's create an app because none of like that exists uh, most apps today that exist focus on self help which means that you you can get many techniques and tricks to to sort of have a good ruby habit routine uh work on yourself and so on but not none exists to actually break your barriers to seek help this is what we have created uh, uh today and it's now under testing and i think should be out on the play store soon uh this will be a free app uh it's from nimhans the organization i mean we are working with them uh on building this app and also looking at how we can uh build interesting intelligent features in the app so that it can help uh, others uh, 
if you're interested in trying it out and giving us feedback i mean just send me an email i'm i'm happy to connect to you uh but more broadly also the way we are looking at it is like a research project where uh we are trying to build something that we believe from research uh should be useful for people with mental health concerns and then we want to actually deploy the app and learn whether that actually helps people or not and of course from those learnings we'll also learn more about what kinds of technologies can be useful how much time do i have sakit 15 minutes at least but you can take 20 minutes it's perfectly fine go ahead okay 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 oh, no sure hurry. sure sure okay uh so with these two right so i've given you a flavor of what we can do on the online space which is global and it as one of the commentators pointed out it's it still is a colored view it still is a very specific sample but it's broad it's it's sort of global audience and then people especially the people who can access the internet and are online uh the second project i showed you was about people who had phones and perhaps could talk in a local regional language not just english but any language like hindi kannada telugu and so on so those people can now access the same kind of resources uh and they can also look at how to break some barriers uh to seek help the third part i want to point out is the probably the part that would affect most people but is also in some sense the most neglected and what do i mean by that so in india there exist mental health helplines which means that there are crisis helplines there are also counseling helplines which means that if you're not feeling well and let's say you are at home what do you do right so one answer is if if you know about these websites you you can ask browse them but that's unlikely uh if you had a phone and you had access to some good apps you would probably use them but after a point you would realize that those apps also are just not that useful because then you're not talking to anyone right you're just sort of working with an app uh so what happens is for most people helplines are a way to actually reach out to someone real and as someone human being on the other end talk about their problem and hopefully if the helpline is good that helpline actually gives them uh, either advice or sort of sometimes they just listen to them and give them this reassurance that someone is there who's listening to them but what's happening in india is that those helplines are underfunded and there have been reports by journalists where for example this journalist tried 40 calls to all the available helplines in india and i think they found like maybe only six of them worked or or some small number like that so what it meant was that nobody was answering these helplines and that's kind of one of the worst things that can happen like you're already feeling down you're already feeling that there's not a lot of hope uh and when you call this one number that is supposed to help you uh that number also responds with uh, nothing no response So this was something that we understood that if we really had to help the mental health landscape in India we cannot ignore helplines like apps are good websites are good i think they are useful but there's still a large fraction of people for whom the only way is helplines and especially because now helplines can connect you to a semi trained counselor which can scale very well so what do we do So what we did was we talked to people who were running helplines. I'm giving you some examples here. Uh, Metri is one, uh, Sahai is another one, Kooch is one. And then finally we found out that there's an organization called Befrienders India which is helping coordinate many of the helplines that run in India. What we found was that these helplines are filled with volunteers who are well intentioned and they want to help but the challenge is that one the volunteers don't work 24 hours obviously right so there are shifts and then many of the shifts are unattended so there's no volunteer and that's the reason why the probability is that if you call a random helpline no one would be available the second we found was that they were facing unique challenges because of covid-19 uh 
many reasons, but I think mostly because they did not have such a good technological infrastructure. So they, they had landline phones that you had to go to, to, to be able to run the helpline. So what we first tried to do was to understand what may be the issues of these helplines. And we did a paper where it, which was interview based, where we interviewed the volunteers of these helplines. And we asked them for sort of what, what is the kind of technology you would hope for? What is the best sort of system you, you would want? And based on that, we have uh, now started a pilot in Kerala, where what we did was that we said, let's all these helplines run but let's connect them through a single number so that one, uh, users don't have to remember so many numbers. So as a person, I just need to remember one number. And at the back end, we can do intelligent routing to route the numbers call to whichever helpline is available right now, maybe whichever helpline is, speaks the same language as the person and so on. So you can do intelligent routing at the back end. But at this point, what we've started with is a pilot in Kerala, which speaks where everyone speaks Malayalam or English. But we are focusing on availability. So we are checking out if, if you dial onto a single number and you can route to different centers automatically, does it actually increase the access to these helplines? And the way we are thinking of it is one, again, that it's going to increase access and we can perhaps add more numbers now. So let's say if it works in Kerala, we can add helplines in Maharashtra and so on. So you can increase the scope to entire India. And the second is that it's also helping us understand to what extent helplines can actually help people with their uh, mental health as well, right? Because one of the things that has happened is that there's not enough research done on the efficacy. So how good are helplines versus an app or how good is, I don't know, like going to a clinical psychologist at Nimhans, of course, that's good. But but if that's not available, then would helplines help? So those kinds of questions are not yet well answered primarily because there's no data. So one of the things we are hoping for is once these kinds of helplines are available that are technologically routed, we'll also start collecting useful data about when people call, how long these calls are uh, with privacy restrictions on what kinds of topics are being talked about and in what cases it's successful. And as a side goal, uh, we are maintaining an up-to-date list of all helplines in India. Um, so this was also another one of these things where we started with a research question, but we found that there's something pretty much very practical we can do because nobody is actually maintaining a full list of all helplines. And so we just did that on our web page. To conclude, uh, I hope I gave you a broad brush on what are the key challenges in mental health today and how technology can be useful in a sense to just augment the capabilities of people who are already working in the domain. Uh, and I gave examples of online systems, apps, and also helplines where we can improve access to mental health resources and also in some cases help few experts to reach a broader uh, population, especially outside the big cities. Uh, if you're interested, you can check out our project. There's a there's a link that I'm sharing here, but you can also just search for moments of change at Microsoft India. Uh, you'll find a list of the papers that we have done and also some of the collaborators that we have. And at this point, I'd be happy to take more questions. Thank you. Thanks, Amit. Uh, so now the floor is open for questions from people. So please go ahead and ask question to Amit. Okay, uh, sir, what are the currently open projects in this moment of change thing? So currently, I think as I mentioned, uh, we are working on the uh, app with Nimhans. So that's the main project that we are focusing on. And separately, there's also a question of how the same uh, technology can be useful in different contexts. So for example, how would it be useful on the web versus how would it be useful inside the workplace, for example. So, so I think the, the main project that we are currently working on is with Nimhans. 
uh, on building this technology and then looking at the data that comes out. Okay, so. So? Yeah. Uh, so, for example, you mentioned that uh, there is no data to see the efficacy of the helplines. Huh. However, how would such data be collected? For example, if a person were to use a particular helpline and then go on to see therapy from a psychiatrist, would that be considered that the helpline did not help the person enough? Or would that be considered a positive that the helpline was capable enough to generate awareness to have the person seek professional help? I think it'd be a positive, the second thing that you mentioned. Yeah. So, but what the question that you've asked is a great one. So <laughs> give me a minute. I think I'll, I can try to answer it. It's a, it's one of the questions that I don't know the answer to, and we are trying to figure out on what would be the good way to measure it. So, so the challenge is uh, not just that uh, there are sort of different pathways. So helplines are one, clinical psychologist is one. It's also that it's a very sensitive domain. So any kind of data collection that we do has to be privacy preserving and has to be with the consent of the caller. Because the last thing you want is a reputation of a helpline that it's it, it will record everything that you say, or it, it will kind of try to use you as data for whatever research that we want to do. So that's number one. So I think you have to be very careful about privacy. And the second is that if you do that, then how do you measure utility, right? So uh, we cannot also just actually call people and ask whether the call was helpful or not, uh, because often people would find of that irritating, of course, but also we have to remember that uh, you might have called at some vulnerable time. And when this call comes, it may come at some other time where you're with other people. And you typically not want people to know that you've been calling this helpline, right? So. So with that in mind, I think the kind of metrics we are looking at are some of them are just correlational, like how much time you're talking, whether you're calling again or not. And then we are looking at innovative ways of asking people on the call itself, uh, probably not by the same you know, counselor, but probably by the system itself. Like once the call ends, maybe there's a system prompt that asks that was this call useful or would you sort of think that you would call again, those, those kinds of things we are exploring. Uh, but definitely, I think, yeah, so the, the referral part is is definitely a plus. So if a helpline helps you get connected to more resources, uh, that's definitely a good thing. I think, yeah, because no one believes, I think, yeah, we won't believe that uh, helplines are the answer. I think helplines may be the answer in some crisis situations, but often if, if a situation is complicated enough, uh, referrals is, or not even referrals, I think just connecting people to more resources itself could be a useful uh, outcome of calling a helpline. Thank you, sir. Great, maybe one more question. If uh, someone yeah. has had it in the mind, please go ahead. Yeah, so I, I wanted to ask again about this privacy issues, which you already touched upon. Right. When uh, given so many, so much privacy issues in online and social media, I would think that the data you will get will be very, very scarce because people may, you know, the portion, proportion of people who even come to online or even calls will be much, much smaller than people who are actually having problems, right? Yes. That is oh, true. Uh, yeah. So you mentioned about anonymous conversations and so on, right? And initially. Yeah. I mean, I mean, would people really come there? Because it's how much can you trust that it is anonymous, right? Yeah. No, that that's a good question. I think there are two two parts of the answer to that. So one is, I, I think what is happening is that the situation is so bad, like, that youngsters are willing to take that bet in a way. Oh, yeah. uh, I think probably because if hmm. you, they, they probably can't talk to their parents about it, or they have tried to talk and it didn't work out. They are probably at some university or somewhere where those resources are not available. 
and i think probably what's ma- mattering more is that they're already used to using apps for many things and they're already sharing a lot so maybe i think for that reason they the young generation is also going a lot on these kinds of forums and and maybe expressing themselves uh for a person like me it's still sort of i'm still surprised that talk life can work <laughs> like the fact that you can post something anonymously and someone some other anonymous person helps you is itself a miracle to me but i think somehow it's it's working uh so that's the first part to your answer i think uh, it's i would be skeptical if if sort of a lot of people were using this but i think it's primarily the the younger generation i think that they're just taking up the apps and other kinds of things much more openly yeah i guess the easy access compared to reaching out to somebody yeah, helps yeah because here i just they just have to go on and key in and went out yeah exactly yeah. yeah but on the other hand though i fully agree with you i think if you really have to understand the challenges and understand sort of the population level mental health we have to move beyond sort of the social media uh and look at things like probably helplines is the best answer that i have today uh but but i don't know but i think yeah we really have to look at sort of all the different kinds of access points and look at what kinds of what kinds of uh, uh even topics are coming about because one thing we also have to realize is like mental health is not just about like a particular person and helping them right if there's a common topic like let's say the common topic is is stress during exams then p- perhaps we have to do something about that as well right uh, and not just sort of help the single person but even there there are now these challenges so if you look at talk life uh most of the content i would say is about either relationships or perf- like academic work performance like sort of success let's say right so professional success on the other hand if you look at helplines uh the distribution is different uh, relationship still is one of the key factors but then there are many financial is a big one so in in helplines often people call because there are financial trouble which is a long term financial trouble and that is affecting their mental health and so i think even those parts show you that there's there's more there and i think yeah one of e- any one platform cannot capture uh, all the issues cool okay thank you i hope uh, this was useful uh, thanks amit for such a wonderful talk and i hope the participants and everybody else have enjoyed it thanks again for accepting our invitation and giving a talk so with that i Definitely. conclude the session